Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. Ahead of this week's GDP report, the White House downplaying worries of an economic downturn. All the while, a research group has changed the definition of recession. Selling U.S. oil reserves to China. It's happening, and it's coming under heavy scrutiny. The company buying the oil has ties to Hunter Biden. Business magnate Bill Gates has reportedly sponsored a Chinese program to recruit foreign scientists. That's amid heightened alarm over the Chinese Communist Party's threat to the Western world. And Russia is reducing gas flow to Europe due to repairs on the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. An expert breaks down what this means for Germany and Americans filling up their tanks. All eyes on the U.S. economy. Economists say this is the most important week of the summer because of all the data coming out. That includes the report on second quarter gross domestic product. It'll give us a clue as to whether we're in a recession or not. And today's Jessica Beatty has more. This week, economists, Americans, and the White House are watching closely for clues of a recession. God willing, I don't think we're going to see a recession. New consumer confidence numbers are coming out Tuesday, followed by an expected interest rate hike by the Federal Reserve on Wednesday and second quarter economic growth rates out on Thursday. With forecasters predicting the second quarter GDP will be negative, the White House argues it doesn't mean there's a recession. In terms of the technical definition, it's not a recession. In the past, a recession was recognized as two negative quarters in a row, according to Investopedia. But the organization that officially declares recessions, the National Bureau of Economic Research, says that's not how it's defined anymore. It also looks at other factors like real income, employment, and wholesale retail sales. The White House is going with the newer definition. The National Bureau of Economic Research uh, that looks at a broad range of data in deciding whether or not there is a recession. And most of that data they look at uh, right now uh, continues to be strong. Not everyone agrees with the White House, including Larry Summers. He was Treasury Secretary under President Bill Clinton. Here's what he told CNN Monday. I think there's a very high likelihood of recession when we've been in this kind of situation before. Recession has essentially always followed when inflation has been high and unemployment uh, has been low. Soft landings represent a kind of triumph of hope over uh, experience. On Wednesday, the Federal Reserve is expected to raise interest rates again. And several key reports will be released this week to give more information on the health of the U.S. economy. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. General Motors is prepping for a possible recession. That means America's largest automaker is cutting back on spending and hiring. The company's CEO says GM is worried about the economy and COVID lockdowns in China have caused factory shutdowns, which hurt GM earnings. Second quarter adjusted earnings fell about $60 million short of forecasts. However, revenue was up because limited supply and strong demand drove up prices. The automaker told investors it expects to hit its full year earnings target. The U.S. is tapping into its oil reserve at an unprecedented speed, and some of that oil is sold to China. The company buying it has ties to the Chinese Communist Party and to Hunter Biden. Records show the Biden administration has sold nearly 6 million barrels of oil from the U.S. Strategic Reserve to an entity with ties to the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. From September 2021 to July 2022, the Department of Energy, or DOE, has awarded three crude oil contracts worth over $460 million to Unipec America. Unipec is the U.S. trading arm of Chinese state-owned oil company Sinopec, but the Unipec contracts have been criticized as the firm's connections to Hunter Biden came into focus in recent weeks. Republican Representative James Comer previously told the Epic Times that under no circumstances should the Department of Energy be making decisions which financially benefit Hunter Biden or any of the Biden family's business partners. Last week, a special assistant to President Biden answered to criticism about selling oil to China, saying the DOE is required by law to sell it in a competitive auction to the highest bidder, regardless of whether that bidder is a foreign company. However, the April and July purchases cost Unipec around $103 and $119 per barrel, respectively. The highest prices offered by comparison were roughly $111 and $125. That's according to a review of DOE contracts by the Epic Times. Republican lawmakers have been watching the oil sales with growing alarm. 
Last week, over 200 House Republicans voted in support of legislation aimed at preventing oil sales to entities with ties to the CCP. Supporting this language is common sense, especially since uh, we need to focus, our increase, focus on increasing energy production and not supporting from our adversaries while Americans are still suffering from outrageously high fuel prices here at home. These reserves are meant to be used for emergencies only. In May, the Department of Energy announced an oil buyback plan. The idea is to buy the oil back at a cheaper price than it was sold, likely after fiscal year 2023 when oil prices are expected to be lower again. As the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party grows in the Western world, Bill Gates' ties to Beijing are also coming under scrutiny. The business giant was recently found to have sponsored a Chinese project to hire foreign scientists. Bill Gates is paying for a Chinese Communist Party-run program tasked with recruiting foreign scientists. That's according to a report by independent media outlet The National Pulse. The article cites a June release from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation website. It announces the award of a $100,000 grant to the Foreign Talent Research Center, an agency affiliated with China's Ministry of Science and Technology. It oversees the hiring of foreign talents in fields like science and engineering. Once recruited, they'll be working on projects to further China's strategic goals, like military civil integration. That's the Beijing policy that allows civil technology development to boost the Chinese military. According to the Gates Foundation, the funding will go to a forum on pandemic preparedness and response held by Zhongguanzun, China's state-sponsored Silicon Valley. Its previous events featured remarks by top leaders of the Chinese regime, including Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping last year. But the forum's objectives go beyond talks about technology and health. Organizers say it also aims to earnestly study and understand the spirit of the General Secretary's 2021 speech and build a technological hub to go toward serving the national strategy. Earlier this month, officials from the FBI and Britain's security service MI5 made a joint speech in London. FBI Director Christopher Wray identified the Chinese Communist Party as the greatest challenge to the international order. We consistently see that it's the Chinese government that poses the biggest long-term threat to our economic and national security. And by our, I mean both of our nations along with our allies in Europe and elsewhere. MI5 director Ken McCallum detailed the Communist Party's threat in terms of covert theft, forced technology transfers, research exploitation, and cyber attacks. The widespread Western assumption that growing prosperity within China and increasing connectivity with the West would automatically lead to greater political freedom has, I'm afraid, been shown to be plain wrong. But the Chinese Communist Party is interested in our democratic media and legal systems. Not to emulate them, sadly, but to use them for its gain. He further explained how Beijing has capitalized on Western democracy. The Chinese Communist Party is also known for using recruitment programs like its Thousand Talents program to lure foreign students to work in China. U.S. officials have warned that this process facilitates the transfer of technology and knowledge to Beijing. Republican lawmakers are using a D.C. summit as a platform to lay out their priorities. What are they vowing to do, and how are they planning to take back the majority in the November elections? And when we take back the majority in November, we're going to get right on that, yes. Gathering at the America First Agenda Summit in Washington, D.C., GOP lawmakers vowing to win back the majority by addressing what's at the top of Americans' minds. Your car costs over 100 bucks to fill up your car. I mean, that's just killing families. People are not going to have any opportunities if we don't get energy under control. Citing high energy costs, Senator Rick Scott and his House GOP colleagues calling to drill more at home to boost energy independence. And it's time to put America first and use the resources that we are so blessed with right here in this country. 
and others turned to law enforcement, with Representative Mike Johnson laying out how a GOP-led Congress would work to prevent tragedies like the mass shooting in Uvalde. He says the country needs to focus not on guns, but on the human heart. We recognize that our rights don't derive from government. They come from God. The foundational principles of our country, the rule of law is one of those, right? Along with individual freedom and limited government and uh, peace through strength and fiscal responsibility and free markets, human dignity, the sanctity of every single human life. I think we need to begin there in addressing the problem, go to the root of it instead of trying to infringe upon the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens. Meanwhile, the calls come right as former President Donald Trump is set to speak at the same summit on Tuesday. It'll mark his first return to Washington since leaving office. We talked to the summit's organizer about what that means. He was the visionary behind so many of these policies, and we saw them work when they were in action. Now we've got the exact opposite. So for him to come out and lay that future out. Reporting Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. Former President Donald Trump returns to the nation's capital today. He is giving the keynote address at the America First Agenda Summit, which is hosted by the America First Policy Institute. The group is a think tank formed by former Trump aides. It's the first time Trump has been in Washington since leaving office 18 months ago. According to the schedule, Trump will speak at 3 p.m. NTD is live streaming the event. And up next, the suspect who confessed to raping the 10-year-old Ohio girl has pled not guilty. His lawyer says he deserves bond. And the famously cheap bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich is a staple for many New Yorkers, but many bodega owners are raising prices amid inflation. Stay tuned for more after this short break. Firefighters have started gaining some control of California's largest wildfire this season. The Oak Fire ignited last Friday near Yosemite National Park. More than 17,000 acres have burned and more than 50 structures have been destroyed. Cal Fire says some 3,000 firefighters are involved in the operation. More than two dozen helicopters and 300 fire trucks have been deployed. So far, 16 percent of the fire has been contained. Still more than 2,000 structures remain under threat. Firefighters are constructing new control lines. Large areas of dry vegetation and steep terrain fueled the fire over the weekend. These factors also make it difficult to contain the flames. Evacuations are underway. At least 3,000 individuals were forced to flee their homes, but in some regions, evacuation orders have been reduced to fire advisories. According to CAL FIRE, the Oak Fire is by far the largest of the California fire season. An update to the story of the 10-year-old Ohio girl who was raped and later got an abortion. The man who confessed to raping her in court yesterday was in court yesterday and has pleaded not guilty. His lawyer says the suspect's confession may not be admissible. What I will need to see first is actually the evidence, the discovery, the police reports, uh, body cam footage, whatever there may be. Um, There are certainly rules governing when a statement to a police officer is admissible and when it's not. The 27-year-old defendant is charged with two felony counts of rape in Columbus, Ohio. He could face life without parole. Police say the man confessed to raping the girl on two separate occasions after he was arrested on July 12th. He's being held without bond ahead of a bond hearing that's yet to be scheduled. His attorney says that under the Constitution, he's entitled to a presumption of innocence and therefore deserves bond. The attorney also says it's a shame how this story has turned political and how various people use it to push their own agenda. The Securities and Exchange Commission has filed insider trading charges against former Congressman Stephen Booyer. Booyer and eight others are being charged in connection with three separate alleged schemes, which together yielded more than $6.8 million. The charges were announced in New York by U.S. Attorney Damian Williams. They come after Boyer bought shares in the telecom company Sprint before it merged with T-Mobile. The prosecutor says Boyer used his job as a business consultant to obtain inside information. He is facing four counts of securities fraud over the alleged deals. Boyer's lawyer says the former congressman is innocent and that his stock trades were lawful. Stephen Boyer, a Republican, was an Indiana congressman between 1993 and 2011. 
A sixth person involved in the decades-old Central Park jogger case had his conviction overturned Monday. The case surrounds the Central Park Five, a group of black and Latino teens convicted of beating and raping a woman in Central Park in 1989. Their convictions were thrown out in 2002. Now, Stephen Lopez has also been exonerated in connection to the case. Lopez was 15 when he was arrested with the group, but he ended up pleading guilty to a lesser charge of robbing a male jogger in order to avoid the more serious rape charge. Lopez spent more than three years in prison before being released. He's now 48 years old. COVID vaccine mandates have been reversed in many areas, but in the Big Apple, people are still getting fired from their jobs because they're not getting the shot. The office of New York Mayor Eric Adams says more than 200 city workers were fired last week for not being vaccinated against the CCP virus. It's not clear which departments they belong to. Earlier this year, Adams fired almost 1,500 public sector workers for the same reason. That's less than 1% of the city's workforce. Another 6,000 city workers have applied for medical or religious exemptions, but have yet to receive an answer. In March, People criticized Adams for exempting some athletes and performers from the mandate while keeping the rule in place for private and public workers. The bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich is a staple for many New Yorkers. But to keep up with inflation, bodega owners have had to raise prices for the famously cheap breakfast sandwiches. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. The classic bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich is a go-to for many New Yorkers. It's easy to make, easy to eat on the go, and it's cheap but not as cheap as it used to be. Bacon and cheese, you can take that away. Bacon and cheese is a favorite uh, sandwich for the New Yorkers. Inflation has forced him to increase prices. The cost of his bacon, egg and cheese sandwich is up from $2.50 to $4.50. Since the beginning of the year, so they start to raise all of the price being uh, uh, skyrocketing, all of the price. Everything is too high. So every time that we go to, to buy stuff, we go to the wholesales, we had to remark the price because um, they, um, the price they be changed every day. According to the Department of Labor, inflation at the wholesale level climbed 11.3 percent in June compared with a year earlier. Producer prices have surged nearly 18 percent for goods and nearly 8 percent for services compared with June 2021. We've seen a pretty dramatic rise in the wholesale costs. So you know whether that is energy or ingredients or materials. Everything's been rising pretty steadily for quite some time, um, you know, and I think consumers, it's showing up for them now. Frances Rice stopped by Marte's Bodega for a bacon, egg and cheese. She's trying to cope with less slack in her budget as prices rise. It means that I buy a good breakfast and stretch it to lunch and don't eat again until I get home which means I lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so there's some benefits, all right. You gotta look at the brighter side of things. But as prices continue to rise, the classic bacon, egg, and cheese may soon be out of reach for some. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Florida has issued stimulus checks for nearly 60,000 families hoping to cover back-to-school expenses for their children. But the effort also created some controversy. Under the assistance program, both foster and needy families are eligible for a one-time payment of $450 per child. Families do not need to apply. Checks have been sent directly to the recipient. A spokeswoman for the Florida Department of Children and Families told the Epic Times that the funds came from the American Rescue Plan Act. The governor's press secretary says the money would be better spent helping families struggling during inflation instead of being returned to the government where it would be, quote, wasted. But critics are saying the spending is bad economic policy and question whether the action might fuel inflation, which is at its highest level in 40 years. Internet search results are saturated with bad and often controversial stories about cops. However, stories of life-saving actions by officers are rare to come by, like the story of an officer who's being mourned by a famous rapper. The rapper says he wouldn't be around if it wasn't for the officer. On Instagram, rapper Lil Wayne posted a goodbye note to a former officer he calls Uncle Bob. The rapper wrote, everything happens for a reason. I was dying when I met you at this very spot. You refused to let me die. Everything that doesn't happen, doesn't happen for a reason. That reason being you and faith. Rest in peace, Uncle Bob. The officer's real name is Robert Hubler, and he recently passed away. The rapper says Hubler saved his life after he attempted suicide by shooting himself in the chest when he was 12 years old. According to NOLA.com, the officer heard the police radio and responded to the scene with other officers. He was off duty at the time. 
There wasn't any ambulance available, so Hubler, together with another officer, rushed him to the hospital. It's reported that Lil Wayne once said he never knew racism because of Hubler's actions. The officer told TMZ in 2021 that the rapper offered him financial assistance for life if he ever needed it. In the interview, Hubler said he did not accept the offer. Airlines canceled and delayed flights across the country on Monday. The disruptions are due to bad weather on the East Coast. The flight tracker, known as FlightAware, reports that over 1,000 flights were canceled by Monday afternoon and more than 4,500 flights were delayed. FlightAware data shows LaGuardia and Newark airports in the New York metro area and Reagan National near Washington, D.C. were hardest hit. Love Field in Dallas also saw departing flights canceled after a shooting incident. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And just ahead, the first shipment of Ukrainian grain is about to leave the country. It's part of Ukraine's effort to help solve the global food crisis. And a German district is producing its own energy to survive the winter fuel crisis. Some say it's a model of how the country can cut its reliance on Russian gas. We'll have all that and more for you in just a minute. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Oh, hey, doesn't it feel like there's communists everywhere? In fact, the Chinese Communist Party has been subverting America from every angle. So whether it's compromising our politicians, controlling Hollywood, manipulating Wall Street, or infiltrating our schools, they have stopped at nothing to take down America. And I believe that in order for us to not become like China, we need citizens who know the truth. So go on over to getepic.com, stay informed with a subscription to the Epic Times, and you will get instant access to this infographic. You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. The first shipments of Ukrainian grain could leave Black Sea ports within days. A deal was brokered last week by the U.N. to open up the ports to help tackle the global food crisis. Here are the details. Ukrainian officials appeared optimistic on Monday, saying grain could start moving again from the country's Black Sea ports within a matter of days. We expect the first shipment to be completed this week. The U.N. echoed the Deputy Infrastructure Minister's sentiment. Russia, Ukraine, Turkey and the UN agreed to a deal last week allowing safe passage in and out of three Ukrainian ports, aimed at easing global food shortages. But a Russian missile strike on the port of Odessa the next day raised questions about whether it would still go ahead. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov brushed off criticism on Monday, saying Moscow only targets military infrastructure. Speaking about the episode which you mentioned that happened in Odessa, There is nothing in the commitments that Russia signed up to in Istanbul on July 22nd that would prohibit us from continuing our special military operation, destroying Ukrainian military infrastructure and other military targets. Ukraine's grain exports have been stalled since February, when Russia sent tens of thousands of troops into Ukraine. Before that, Ukraine and Russia accounted for one-third of global wheat exports. 
rising energy prices and a global wheat shortage are some of the most far-reaching effects of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Moscow denies responsibility for the food crisis, blaming Western sanctions for slowing its food and fertilizer exports, and Ukraine for mining the approaches to its ports. Ukraine's infrastructure minister said officials are taking steps to make sure product moves safely. All convoys will be accompanied by Ukrainian rescue vessels. They will go first along with the vessels of the Ministry of Infrastructure. But we must say that this is not a simple process. Ukraine's first deputy secretary of the National Security and Defense Council was removed from his post. The country's head of state released a decree on Ruslan Demchenko's dismissal. Officials said the decision was made due to his health problems, but the Kyiv Post says it's allegedly linked to the Kharkiv agreements signed between Kyiv and Moscow in 2010. Those agreements allowed Russia to expand the base of its Black Sea fleet in Crimea to until 2042. The agreement implied concessions from Ukraine, and that ultimately prompted Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. The Post says Demchenko is suspected of having lobbied in the process. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky also recently announced the new chair of the Intelligence Affairs Committee. This committee was previously headed by Demchenko. Emmanuel Macron touched down in Cameroon late on Monday. This is the first leg in the French president's trip to three African nations against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine. The African continent has largely refused to join Western condemnation and sanctions on Russia, and it's being diplomatically courted by both sides in the conflict. This week, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, is on a tour of four African countries. The U.S. Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa is heading to Egypt and Ethiopia. And after Cameroon, Macron plans to visit Benin and Guinea-Bissau. The French president was greeted in Cameroon's capital by the country's prime minister. He's also expected to meet with President Paul Bia. Thanks, talks will focus on the food crisis caused by the Ukraine conflict, as well as preparations for the next Africa-France summit. Germany is scrambling to avert a fuel crisis this winter, but one rural district has become a role model for how the country might reduce dependence on Russian gas by producing all the energy that it consumes itself. Let's take a look. Brian Hunsrook uses a combination of solar, wind and biofuel to generate enough power to run its homes, public buildings and businesses. It even leaves enough to contribute to an electric car sharing service and e-bikes. The area's energy transition has been a relatively rapid one, according to District Climate Protection Manager Frank Mikhail Ulha. Up until 1995, not a single kilowatt hour of energy used in our district was produced by us. Everything had to be imported. Then some courageous visionaries said wars are being fought about oil and gas and we need to do something about it. They collected money for the first wind turbine which produced electricity for 200 households. Today, we have 279 wind turbines, which generate electricity for 300,000 households. Brian Hunsrück also has biofuel plants, and its towns and villages are dotted with solar panels. At a national level, Germany is targeting carbon neutrality by 2045, and for renewables to contribute 80% of power generation by 2030. But Berlin is currently being forced to contemplate the unsettling prospect of gas rationing during the winter. Thomas Lorenz, manager of the Western District's Waste Management Facility, says biofuel from woodland waste generates the equivalent of one million litres of heating oil per year, and they could make even more. We are currently using about half the waste. If we wanted to process all of it, we could easily operate three other heating plants. So in theory, we could operate six plants. The district's energy transition has also brought economic benefits. Its unemployment rate has fallen to 3.5 per cent, below the national average of 5.3 per cent, and data from the Rhineland-Palatinate region's energy agency shows local municipalities are debt-free and have financial reserves of 101 million US dollars. A Russian state-owned energy company is further reducing gas flow to Europe. We hear from an expert on this. He explains how this will affect Germany's oil supply and Americans at the pump. Please welcome Brent Bennett, who is a policy director for Life Powered. Thanks for talking to us about this important energy topic today, Brent. Thank you. Great to be here. There is now more turbine repairs on shareholder Gazprom's Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which sends gas from Russia to Germany. And as a result, there's going to be a reduced gas flow. What does this mean for Germany's oil supply? 
yeah, it's it's going to be a real uh, tough problem going into the wintertime. You know, Germany gets 40% of their gas from Russia, and the well, Europe in general gets 40% of their gas from Russia. And so even a, a 20% cut to that supply uh, could mean a lot of trouble. And Europe is already uh, looking at instituting a 15% cut uh, in their gas consumption, uh, which is going to really, uh, really crimp their economic growth. It's already sending them into a recession. So it's 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 going to be a really huge problem come wintertime when they're going to need that energy more and more. So what can Germany do about this gas shortage? Yeah, in the short term, they have to find other supplies, right? Uh, they have to get gas from the Middle East, from the U.S., other parts of the world, but it's going to come at a higher cost. Uh, in the long term, they need to increase their domestic uh, production. They, they can't just replace Russian imports with more imports. Uh, and they have plenty of gas in Europe. They just refuse to develop it. Uh, so that's really, over the course of the decade, if they're going to wean themselves off of Russian gas, that's what they have to do. So what would this mean for America if they had to source it from the U.S.? Yeah, it's definitely raising prices around the world, right? So, of course, gas is an international market, and whatever, uh, whenever there's a shortage in one area, that raises prices for the rest of us. And that's what we're seeing here. We've seen gas prices more than double uh, in the U.S. over the past uh, year or so. So it's it's going to be a big uh, a big challenge for us to supply more gas to Europe and also to keep ourselves supplied. Economists fear that the EU faces a recession if Russia does end up set cutting off supplies to Europe. What would this mean for Americans? Yeah, I think EU is already going towards a recession. That's almost a foregone conclusion. Um, yeah, for the U.S., it's it's going to mean uh, certainly uh, you know. Uh, definitely reduce trade with Europe. Uh, that's a problem. But also, you know, the biggest impact for us is just the higher energy prices globally. Uh, we're paying more for oil, more for gas. Uh, and that's what's kind of tipping the U.S. towards recession as well. Uh, so we have to find ways to increase our production in order to make up for that deficit that we're facing right now. Your foundation talks about energy IQ. What has the EU done and the U.S. done right and wrong in terms of sourcing their energy supplies? Yeah, well, the, in a lot of ways, energy investments are a zero-sum game, right? If you invest too much in one area and not enough in another, then you're gonna you're gonna see impacts of that. And you know, especially Europe has gone all in on wind and solar. They've overinvested in it in a sense. They've built more than what they can reliably back up, and they're invested too much in imports and not enough in domestic production. Uh, and so, unfortunately, we're seeing the same kind of thing happening in the U.S. over the past year and a half. We're not seeing enough investment in domestic production in part due to capital constraints and also due to the actions of the administration uh, in Washington. So if we, don't, if we don't move to increase our domestic production and to invest properly in the energy that we need, uh, then we're going to be running into the same problems as Europe. You know, fortunately, we haven't faced shortages yet. This is not the 1970s yet because we've had a great success over the past decade plus of increasing our domestic production. But if we, if we stop that, then we're going to lose track. Brent Bennett at Life Powered, thank you so much for your analysis. Thank you. Russia says it will withdraw from the International Space Station project in 2024 after fulfilling its obligations. That's according to the Kremlin's readout of a meeting between the newly appointed head of Roscosmos and Russian President Vladimir Putin. Leaders say after withdrawing from the ISS project, Russia will create its own space station. Russia's withdrawal would be a major blow to the ISS, which has been a model of international cooperation for decades. The announcement comes as Russia's war on Ukraine has deeply strained its relationship with the U.S. and Europe. And coming up, the race for the British prime ministerial candidate is running between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. Both have made China the focus of their debates. Stay tuned for more right here on NTD News. And now to the race to succeed British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. The final two candidates, Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, have brought China into focus in their run-up to their debates. Both are members of the Conservative Party, also known as the Tory Party. This report comes from NTD's Malcolm Hudson. China has become a key point of focus in the Tory leadership race. Former Chancellor Rishi Sunak said China is Britain's biggest long-term threat and promised to close all 30 Confucius Institutes in the UK, which are understood to be soft power arms of the Chinese regime. But his apparent anti-China stance has come under scrutiny from Liz Truss's supporters, particularly because Sunak's treasury pushed hard for an economic deal with the Asian nation. In a press statement on Sunday, Sunak drew a hard line against China, saying, 
At home, they are stealing our technology and infiltrating our universities. And abroad, they are propping up Putin's fascist invasion of Ukraine by buying his oil and attempting to bully their neighbours, including Taiwan. He noted how the Chinese regime is using debt traps on developing countries as a power grab and mentioned the detention and torture of Chinese citizens in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. He also said politicians in Britain and the West have rolled out the red carpet and turned a blind eye to China's nefarious activity and ambitions. From there, Sunak promised to close all 30 Confucius Institutes in UK universities. The institutes are funded by the Chinese authority and are understood to be propaganda tools. Under the guise of promoting Chinese culture in foreign nations, Confucius Institutes suppress discussion about topics such as Tibet, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners. Sunak also proposed creating a NATO-style alliance against China's technological aggression and countering Chinese industrial espionage in UK businesses and universities. But those claims were met with scepticism by Truss's supporters. Sir Ian Duncan Smith called the announcement surprising. He said that over the last two years, the Treasury has pushed hard for an economic deal with China, despite China sanctioning five MPs. Duncan Smith noted the same issues Sunak raised and asked the former Chancellor, where have you been over the last two years? Sunak's turn of heart comes in the wake of reports about his soft and even positive stance on China. In the recent leadership debates, he expressed a mellower position. Where values can be protected, he says he favours trade. On top of this is the positive coverage Sunak received from Chinese state-run media Global Times. It's thought his new stance seeks to win the support of China hawks by dispelling the image that he is too soft on China. Meanwhile, Truss's campaign has said, Liz has strengthened Britain's position on China since becoming Foreign Secretary. Her spokesperson said she will continue to do so as Prime Minister. Former leadership hopeful Tom Tugendhat welcomed Truss and Sunak's stances, saying, I'm pleased that both Tory leadership candidates have recognised the challenges raised by China and called to reduce strategic dependence on Beijing. Truss has had a year's worth of action to back up her stance. She used to be supportive of China, but over the last year we've seen her position turn around, whereas Sunak has only just begun to change his tune, so it remains to be seen how firm his resolve really is. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News, London. A panel discussion aimed at uncovering the true nature of the Chinese Communist Party was successfully held this week, but not without issues. The event's organizer reportedly received a death threat from suspected Chinese authorities. Here's a closer look. On Wednesday, a panel was held to discuss the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. The event was called Wake Up to the CCP's Threat. It was organized by the Global Service Center for Quitting the CCP and the Mount Hope Chinese Association. The Global Service Center for Quitting the CCP helps members of the party and its affiliated organizations renounce their support for the regime. Part of that process involves choosing pseudonyms to protect their safety and to prevent retaliation from Chinese authorities. Two days ahead of the event, one of the organizers, Chris Chung, received the following voice message. Hello, this is a representative of the Chinese Communist Party. We at the Chinese Communist Party have a particular set of skills. We will cook you a great chicken curry, and then we will find you, and we will kill you. The message also told Chung, quote, if you attend the 7 p.m. event, you are responsible for the consequences. The event organizers reported it to the police and FBI. In the end, the panel still went smoothly, with police standing by on site. Among the highlights of the event, American professor Zhang Tianling explained how the Chinese regime infiltrates the U.S. through five methods. Those are overseas propaganda, data collection, intellectual property theft, political agents, and educational or cultural exchange programs. The panel was held in Mount Hope, a town located in upstate New York. Locals voiced positive feedback. I thought it was very, very uh, informational and uh, I, I benefited greatly from being here. The town's mayor also voiced support and explained what he believes the event brought to the community. People here in the community can educate themselves so this way that communism doesn't come here to America. Very important. But I think it's even uh, more bold and more brave for the panelists and the organizers to come through and hold such a great community event to show the CCP that they can't scare us into hiding. 
What's more, a panel member explained why the threat Chung received is so significant. Um, but they use threats commonly to threaten and make people feel afraid to have that fear. And that's even more reason why America is the land of the free, home of the brave. We need to stand for those values and to not succumb to the fear of the CCP, the terror that the CCP rules by. NTD, New York. Amid growing military pressure from China, Taiwan held its largest annual naval and air exercises this week. President Tsai Ing-wen personally boarded a Navy warship to oversee the exercises. She praised the military's determination to defend the island. To all the brothers and sisters fighting on the waters, the excellent drill by everyone just now demonstrated the ability and determination by the soldiers of the Republic of China to defend the country. Let's continue to work hard and guard our homeland together. After Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Taiwan raised its alert level for fear that China might launch a similar attack. This year, its annual drills simulated missile attacks from communist China. Twenty warships, including frigates and destroyers, intercepted possible incursions off the northeast coast of Taiwan. A fleet of F-16 and domestic fighter jets launched airstrikes. Virtually the entire city of Taipei in northern Taiwan was shut down. This was to reduce the chances of being targeted during nighttime airstrikes. Firefighters also practiced putting out a blaze caused by a fake missile strike. President Tsai was seen in a camouflage uniform aboard a decommissioned guided missile destroyer. This is the second time in her six years in office that she has boarded a warship. In an Indian hill town, two special guests from Tibet shared what it was like being imprisoned by the Chinese Communist Party. I was born in 1970 and my family has been tortured heavily by the Chinese government. Because of this oppression by the Chinese government in Tibet in 2008, I organized many campaigns against such atrocities and was later imprisoned. People from all over the world were on hand to hear the two former prisoners share their story. The speakers were jailed as so-called political prisoners by the Chinese Communist Party. The two are part of a group of Tibetans who protest against the oppression of the Chinese regime. Those Tibetans are often treated harshly and tortured by the Communist regime. These repressions turn Tibet into a virtual prison. Its former head, the Dalai Lama, fled to India after a failed bid for autonomy. And in 1989, the Dalai Lama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his nonviolent efforts to liberate the region. But Beijing has dismissed his winning the award as a challenge to its authority. The suspect involved in the fatal shooting of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has been moved out of Nara Police Station. Japanese public broadcaster NHK says the district's public prosecutors asked that he be moved to a detention house. The prosecutor's office also asked that the suspect undergo mental health checks until November 29th. That's to determine if he can be indicted and held criminally responsible. According to authorities, the 41-year-old has already admitted to shooting Abe. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And still to come, a new law bans the construction of small hydroelectric power plants in Bosnia, but activists say they still have a long way to go to protect the country's rivers. And new devices are trapping plastic trash in rivers and smaller streams before it can get into the ocean. An estimated 8.8 million tons of plastic enter the ocean every year. Find out more in just a minute here on NTD News. Take a look at these age spots. They seem to vanish right before your eyes. Oh my God! If you want to see blemishes seem to disappear in seconds for a flawless complexion, you can't get this look with regular old-fashioned makeup. So to get results like this and look years younger instantly, we have big news. At Luminous, we've taken our airbrush and now made it so easy for every day. Introducing Breeze, our all-new cordless handheld two-in-one airbrush system that applies makeup and skincare faster and easier than any anything you've ever tried before. Putting the drops in. Just hit the button real simple. Mm-hmm. It's so wow. easy. It knows exactly where it needs to blend and where it needs to go. The makeup you're using can look dry and cakey and can make your skin look rough. But with Breeze, you can go from this 
to this. The secret is how our premium foundations blend onto the skin with an ultra fine mist using the power of air. Very little foundation is needed. Up to 10 times less makeup compared to what you're using. But you're also getting three times more coverage at the same time. That's maximum coverage using less makeup. It's clear. Traditional makeup can make you look older, while Breeze is specially designed for maturing skin, helping it to look smooth and so much younger. It's your anti-aging, moisturizing primer, concealer, and foundation, all in one simple step. And with so many shades, we give you a color match guarantee, so you're guaranteed the perfect shade that's just right for you. We're so confident you're going to love our all-new, best-ever 2-in-1 handheld airbrush system. We give you a full 30-day money-back guarantee. Call or go online and use this special promo code right now so you can get Breeze, our all-new handheld 2-in-1 airbrush to try at home for only $19.95. And you'll even get free shipping. There is a new and exciting way to look dramatically younger with Breeze. Luminous is not available in stores. You can only get this exclusive offer here. So don't wait. Order your new cordless handheld Breeze now. Call 800-451-9044 or go to getbreeze.com. Order now. Welcome back. A garden hidden for 300 years has been unlocked by the recent record high temperatures in the UK. The extreme heat exposed the remnants of an ornate 17th century garden design at Chatsworth in Derbyshire. The old European style formal garden was designed in 1699 for the first Duke of Devonshire. Chatsworth has been home to the Devonshire family for 16 generations. It's located in the Peak District National Park. The house and much of the surrounding landscape are leased to the charity Chatsworth House Trust. The trust said the drone footage was taken on July 14th. The aerial view shows the garden amid the hot weather, including past drawings of what the garden looked like when it was in place. The head of gardens and landscape said the current heat wave has revealed a hidden gem. A new law banning the construction of small hydroelectric power plants is a victory for Bosnian conservation activists. They say the infrastructure damages fragile river ecosystems and plan to fight to protect the unique waterways. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. Bosnia's Neretva River is a scenic paradise and a beautiful spot for rafting. There, Balkan activists have scored an important victory in conserving the river and others. This whole business with small hydropower plants began some 15 years ago when investors started visiting villages and promising prosperity to the local people. Rivers were supposed to be prettified. We were supposed to generate significant quantities of clean electricity, and local communities were promised it will all benefit them greatly. Some activists say investors began trapping rivers and diverting them with pipes, taking away water used daily by locals and wildlife, and eroding and degrading nearby forests. As it turned out, the impact of small hydropower plants was very harmful. The loss of river water used by people for agriculture, animals and drinking, as well as erosion of forests, soon became visible to the naked eye. According to official data, the owners of small Bosnian hydropower plants over the past decade have been raking in millions in subsidies, while paying meager concession fees, typically between 1 and 3 percent of their income. In the meantime, the promise transition to renewable energy never really materialized. In 2021, Bosnia's small hydropower plants contributed only 2.5 percent of the nation's electricity. So residents of Bosnia's riverside villages and towns started mobilizing, documenting the plant's destruction of nature, and launching court challenges. People in the Balkans stood up against investors on their river. You know, they were not knowledgeable people, they were no ecological experts or scientists, they were ordinary people that live next to the river. And they didn't want and they don't want their river to be stolen away. In about a dozen cases, Bosnian courts said authorities had failed to consult with local communities, protect nature conservation areas, and demand environmental impact studies. But in numerous other cases, authorities allowed construction projects to proceed despite successful legal challenges. For conservationists, the fight continues to protect rivers from being degraded, diverted, and commercialized. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. 
Millions of tons of plastic wind up in the ocean every year, killing plants and animals. To combat the problem, new devices are being used or tested worldwide to trap plastic trash in rivers and smaller streams before it can get into the ocean. This is Waste Shark, a boxy five-foot aquatic drone. It's sucking up plastic waste in a pond in Rotterdam, Netherlands. Richard Hardiman, founder and CEO of tech company Ranmarine, explains the mission. So we wanted it to be as easy to deploy as possible, as easy to capture the trash and bring it back to land, make it safer so that the operator stood on the shore rather than was in the water, make it battery operated so it was zero emissions, not diesel or fossil fuel powered, and it was easy to store away. The drone's hold can accommodate 42 gallons of trash, floating plants, and algae, and can operate for up to eight hours on a single charge. It's inspired by the whale shark, which swims the ocean with its mouth wide open. The whale shark is based on the whale shark, which has a large mouth for capturing its prey. So that's why we have two pontoons, one on each side, um, so that the waste can come in from the front and it gets trapped in between the pontoons. According to the developers, more than 40 have been sold to buyers in a dozen countries, including the UK, US, Nigeria, and Singapore. We wanted something very sleek, very simple, gets the trash out and starts recycling faster than, than what has been done right now. Meanwhile, a similar project is happening in the southeast U.S. The Osprey Initiative of Mobile, Alabama sets up floating traps on creeks, canals and rivers. Osprey trains local crews to deal with the trash they catch. It's also helping change habits in the local community. The awareness, what we're doing and being smart about it, people are really bringing that home and the best way to fight litter and litter in the water is it never becoming litter on the land. Waste can maim or kill marine plants and animals, including whales, dolphins, and seabirds. These devices are an attempt to put a dent in the estimated 8.8 .8 million tons of plastic that enter the ocean every year. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Up next, a new medical study is challenging the idea that depression is caused by a brain chemical imbalance. We hear from a doctor who conducted the research right after this short break. For decades, researchers have said that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. But is that really the case? According to a recent study, that connection may have been wrong all along. And today's Jason Perry has the story. So there's been this long-standing theory that depression is caused by a lack of serotonin in the brain. Joanna Moncrief is a professor of critical and social psychiatry at University College London, and she's also a practicing psychiatrist. In a recent study, she and her team gathered all types of research that's tried to find evidence of an association between serotonin and depression. For example, research on serotonin receptors, serotonin levels, serotonin metabolite levels, research on genes, and research that's tried lowering serotonin levels in people without depression to see if it will induce a low mood. We got all the, the research from all these different areas together and took an overview, and none of the research in any of the different areas provided convincing evidence that there is a link between serotonin and depression, even that there's any link, and it certainly didn't provide evidence that depression is caused by or even linked with low serotonin levels. I also spoke with Dr. Peter Bregan, a psychiatrist who wrote scientific articles in the 1990s about there being no association between serotonin and depression. He's also the author of COVID-19 and the Global Predators, We Are the Prey. When looking for a therapist, he says find one who's upbeat caring, and seems to like and relate warmly to you. If the person instead uh, takes out a, uh, a pad of paper and starts to write a prescription, used to do that in the old days, now of course it's done electronically, or if the person uh, tells you you have a biochemical imbalance, which you know is untrue, if the person does anything except strengthen and encourage you to handle the world, go find somebody else, period. Both doctors I spoke with warned that no one should suddenly stop taking their antidepressants. And if someone does decide to do that, it should be done slowly and carefully with the support of a professional. Jason Perry, NTD News. 
A lifeguard drone in Spain saved the life of a 14-year-old boy. Drone operators at a beach in Valencia discovered a young swimmer who had little energy left to stay afloat as he struggled against a powerful tide. So they sent a drone to drop a life vest, which the teenager held onto just as he started to sink below the waves. After being rescued, the boy was admitted to a hospital after ambulance personnel provided him with oxygen. He was sent home 24 hours later. Drone operators work with lifeguards at 22 beaches across Spain. They provide rapid support to potential drowning victims before lifeguards can physically reach the scene. A total of 140 people have died from accidental drowning in Spain in the first six months of 2022. That's over 50 percent more than the same period last year. Lottery officials raised the Mega Millions grand prize to $810 million, giving players a shot at would be the nation's fourth largest jackpot. The next drawing will be tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern Time. The jackpot has grown so large because there hasn't been a winner in three months. The highlighted pre tax $810 million prize is for a winner who takes an annuity option paid out in 30 annual payments. Most players choose the cash option, which for Tuesday's drawing would be $470.1 million. Mega Millions is played in 45 states, as well as Washington, D.C. and the U.S. Virgin Islands. The game is overseen by state lottery officials. The odds of winning tonight's jackpot are 1 in 303 million. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put our email address on screen. We'd love to hear from you. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.